Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for our CDC Dental Public Health Lecture Series. My name is Gina Thornton Evans, and I'm the director of the CDC Dental Public Health Residency Program and also a team lead for the surveillance investigations and research team within the Division of Oral Health at CDC. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. George Taylor. Dr. Taylor is a professor in the Department of Preventative and Restorative Dental Sciences in the Division of Oral Epidemiology and Dental Public Health. He is also the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at the University of California, San Francisco School of Dentistry. He is a board certified specialist in dental public health um, he began his career as a dentist in the U.S. Air Force for four years, and for the past 40 years, he's been in an academic setting, teaching, conducting research, and providing patient care. In his role as an Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion, he works to strengthen the School of Dentistry as a diverse and inclusive climate that empowers students, faculty, and staff to maximize their capacity in learning, working, serving, and growing together. Dr. Taylor's major research focus is on relationships between oral and systemic health, particularly periodontal infection and diabetes outcomes. He is the past president of the American Board of Dental Public Health, and he's also served on the Council of Scientific Affairs of the American Dental Association and the NIDCR Board of Scientific Counselors. Additionally, he actively mentors students, residents, and other faculty in their careers with respect to research. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Taylor. Thank you, Dr. Thornton Evans. Uh, it's certainly an honor to be here today to share uh, some of the some of my learnings with the audience. Um, I appreciate your uh, introduction, and I'm going to go ahead and and uh, thank you for all who are uh, attending and welcome today as well. Um, I'm going to uh, start sharing my slides, and I'll share my screen, and I'll go from there. May I just confirm that you can see my um, my first slide? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, today is my really my pleasure to talk about diabetes and oral health and uh, diverse research perspectives. I'm going to, uh, we're gonna have a journey where I, describe study designs that are appropriate for addressing um, different kinds of questions. Um, that'll be uh, intertwined with uh, talking about the state of evidence uh, with respect to many different uh, associations between diabetes and oral health, uh, going in actually going in both directions as well. So um, I'm, Provide, providing this slide for uh, members of our audience are not, who are, are, are not dentists uh, to get a visual picture of uh, periodontal uh, disease. And in this case, uh, we're gonna, reason I show periodontal disease first is because it is one of the, the major oral health conditions that um, contributes to a bi-directional relationship between um, diabetes and um, oral health. And uh, just to, as a review and uh, perhaps an, uh, some additional information, we see here in this slide, two, two forms of periodontal disease. The top slide is gingivitis, 
this is where the gingiva is uh, inflamed, and yet there's not any loss of the supporting structures of the periodontal ligaments or the alveolar bone in, uh, that supports all of the teeth. You can see uh, the gingivitis, and then you can see a very severe periodontitis. Uh, this is, happens to be a person who has diabetes, um, and you can see just about every single um, aspect of of oral health as it put or poor oral health as it pertains to the teeth and the gums. Uh, you see um, gingival recession, you see loss of loss of support where the gingival would normally be here. There's recession. You see very poor um, oral hygiene. You see very uh, edematous as well as uh, as well as uh, tissue that uh, that is uh, very um, inflamed. Um, just to get a, a contrast, now here's a healthy periodontal tissue. So this is a, this is a, a patient who does not have gingivitis or periodontitis. Uh, again, you see here again, very severe periodontitis. And in between, you see gingivitis, swollen, swollen tissue, but not um, severe, not severe uh, re recession. Here we see a little recession in this area. Uh, so this person has uh, very localized periodontitis, mostly gin gingivitis, and, um, and in this case, generalized severe periodontitis. So that we're gonna see some other, other slides as I'm going through. But um, first of all, I'd like to start uh, talking about um, evidence from the cross-sectional um, point of view. And of course, we know that cross-sectional studies are. Uh, 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 where measurements are all, uh, all taken at the same point in time. And um, in our situation, the, the controls would be people without diabetes or the people without periodontitis. Uh, cases would be those with periodontitis or those with diabetes. And I mentioned both of those because we are thinking about a bi-directional relationship. And then um, we analyze those studies from uh, the point of view of amongst the, the people, um, of the control group, if you will, those who are exposed or not exposed to the, uh, to the, um, out to the exposure, which might be, in this case, periodontitis or um, tooth loss. It might be uh, diabetes. It might be those with poor glycemic control. It might be those with gestational diabetes. Those are some of the things we're gonna talk about. So I'm gonna, First, talk a little bit about the evidence for um, as it pertains to um, periodontal for pertains to periodontal health as well as um, diabetes and different and, and different aspects of diabetes status. So this is um, an older slide, and yet the the proportions and the prevalence of moderate and severe periodontitis by age remain about the same, and you can see a gradient. As age increases, uh, as age increases, so does the uh, does, so does the pre prevalence of moderate or severe periodontitis. Moderate periodontitis here, uh, severe periodontitis here. Um, lower a lower proportion of the population has uh, severe periodontitis. A great much greater proportion of the population have has um, the moderate periodontitis except when we get to, uh, and then you can see a summary here, about 8.8% have severe periodontitis, about 30% have moderate. Um, to the right of the slide, these are, these are the definitions for the um, American Association of Periodontology Centers for Disease Control um, the, um, method for uh, assessing um, periodontal disease. It's been changed, uh, the classification has been changed just a little bit, um, and yet, uh, the proportion, as I said, this, these uh, these prevalences are uh, about the same. So then, um, first we're going to uh, look at diabetes and pre-diabetes and their adverse effects on periodontal health. Here is uh, a striking slide, I believe. Um, it, as you can see, that uh, we look, have the categories of those with uh, who have uh, smoking status of never smoker, former smoker, or current smoker. Now, um, reason that we um, put the, um, our, our um, participants in the study, this is an inhane study. Um, we, the reason is because uh, tobacco use, particularly smoking, 
is one of, of the most uh, prominent uh, contributors to um, per poor or peridotal health. And yet, as you can see in each category from never smoker to former smoker to cur current smoker, we can also see a gradient for uh, diabetes status. This is normal, normal glycemia, uh, pre-diabetes, and then diabetes. In each, in each category, you see that we see the same gradient. So that's the, that's the impact that diabetes has on um, being associated with poorer periodontal health. Um, so then we would go look at the next slide. And so diabetes, those were adults. Now, um, diabetes has adverse effects on periodontal health in um, children with type 1 diabetes. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, people, um, adults with type 1 or type 2 diabetes, I'll share a study about, uh, with that respect, and also gestational diabetes. So then, um, first of all, we're going to talk about a case control study uh, conducted at Columbia University. And uh, I thought it would be helpful to share this image where uh, in a case control study, uh, cases are identified. In this case, it would be those with periodontal disease and control would, would be those without periodontal disease. Uh, and we could say uh, good health, oral health. And then from there, we look to see who was exposed, who was exposed amongst the controls who was not exposed. And then we do the same thing with the, uh, with the cases. So the point is that we first identify cases and then look yeah, look backwards to determine it, what their um, exposure status was. That's uh, the way that we um, lay, design a case control study and then we perform the analysis that way. So then this, this uh, slide shows um, a study by um, Evi Lala and colleagues um, at Columbia. And it, was, and it is about um, the percent of children with periodontal attachment loss greater than or equal to two millimeters and uh, greater than or equal to two teeth. Um, as you can see, these are the controls and uh, these are the cases. Um, what's most striking in this slide and here, and, most, and the two age groups, uh, six to 11 and then 12 to 18 years old. What's most striking is the difference in the proportion of people, uh, of children, children and adolescents who had no teeth with um, a periodontal attachment loss. Um, in the case of the controls uh, for the 60 to 11 year olds, you can, can see the dramatic difference or a, a much smaller proportion who had, um, who had um, a, attachment loss um, or had no teeth that were had attachment loss in the, in the cases. Uh, so that, that is um, the, one of the, the important findings that um, uh, the Columbia Group have made and have uh, probably several papers on that. Um, so then we're seeing that there's an association uh, between um, di diabetes, type 1 diabetes, and per periodontal health. Then um, if we look at uh, a na statistical analysis, um, we we can see that um, amongst all ages combined in the group that um, Lala was studying, um, the odds ratio for those having um, poorer periodontal health, in this case, uh, two or more teeth um, with um, attachment loss was um, five-fold greater for those um, with diabetes than those without diabetes. And also in that model, um, 12 to 18-year-olds um, had a 4.8 greater odds ratio for um, a attachment loss of two millimeters or greater when compared to the, those odds were 4.8 times greater when compared to the six to 11 year olds. Um, they also conducted separate studies and we saw, and they were able to see that in the 11 year old and the six to 11 year olds, the odds ratio was 3.44. Um, all of these odds ratios are statistically significant because there's no one uh, um, in, involved. The, if there was a value of one, that meant that, that that would mean that there's no difference. In the 12 to 18 year olds, you see uh, a 20 fold higher odds um, and a very large confidence interval that doesn't include one 
This is probably due to uh, the, uh, the sample size and um, the way that people were, uh, the prevalence of people filling some of the different groups. But the, the point is that in, in children and adolescents with type one diabetes in their studies, they did find a, uh, a, an important and significant association between uh, the, uh, in the case and controls for um, having poor or periodontal health. Uh, next, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about um, research um, we'll, and we'll, um, with respect to case, con with respect to uh, prospective or cohort studies. Cohort studies can also be, be retrospective. Um, in the cohort study, we uh, first um, assign people, determine the person's um, exposure. And this example, it uses smokers. Um, so the comparison groups um, are identified and, and the sampling is done on their exposure status. In this case, um, there's a group who are exposed to, to tobacco use. And uh, there's also a comparison group that is not exposed. They are followed over time or they are looked at um, retrospectively. And um, then they compare the outcomes, as you can see, um, a greater proportion of the, of the images, uh, the stick figures have, um, have uh, this, uh, the outcome, whatever that outcome would, might be, let's say it's poor or periodontal health, than those who were non-smokers. And um, you see one as opposed to three. So then um, again, the, the point is that uh, cohort studies allow us to follow uh, our participants over time or to look retrospectively but the key and the distinction between cohort studies and case control studies is that case control studies start with the cases or sample on the case, those who are cases and who are not cases to select them into the study. Whereas the uh, cohort study uh, samples on the exposure, who was exposed and who was not exposure. Now we're gonna take a look at some prospective cohort st uh, studies. This um, radiograph is um, a, a Actually, the top figure uh, was at baseline. The lower radiographs are at, at uh, two years subsequent. This is uh, a, uh, two, sets of um, two sets of radiographs from the Gila River Indian community. And I wanna respect and acknowledge the members of the Gila River Indian community for uh, participating in this um, long-term study of uh, that the NIDDK uh, conducted for um, examining and learning about um, periodontal, learning about diabetes, um, particularly, and in this case, specifically type 2 diabetes. Uh, Dr. Bob, the late Dr. Bob Jenko was the uh, principal investigator for the oral health component, and I was very fortunate to be able to um, join that team when I was working on my doctorate in public health. And um, so I have um, had quite a bit of experience um, with the Gila River Indian communities data. And this shows us um, the point for this slide is to um, examine just how much and how rapidly um, periodontal tissue destruction can occur in people with type two diabetes. And then if they're, more, and if they're poorly controlled, then that actually makes the, the uh, destruction more severe and also more rapid. Here's the, here's the panoramic radiograph where you can see all of the teeth at baseline. Uh, the key is to look at where the alveolar bone support is. Here uh, we can see um, um, extensive resorption of bone. Typically the bone level was stopped right at just below the, the junction between the crown and the root. In this case at baseline, there was already bone loss and over here, uh, there was even, even more bone loss. So what happened was, you can see this is the amount of bone supporting the tooth um, at baseline. Then when we look two years later, look at the difference. Uh, they, there's, a great, uh, there's a great destruction of the alveolar bone. All of this lucency, all of this dark gray area here is, uh, represents bone loss. The bone loss also is, occurs between the two roots. We call that the percation. You see that the bone is full at, at baseline. Two years later, 
we see um, just rapid destruction and loss of, of tissue. This is, um, this is a, um, an, a manifestation. Um, and as uh, Harold Lur said in 1993, considered uh, periodontal disease to be the sixth complication of diabetes. So with that in mind, we wanna look at um, what um, the, our analysis of the incidence of alveolar bone loss after two years in a cohort study um, was. And the three groups that we compare are those without diabetes, those with uh, diabetes and better control. At, at that time, the um, glycemic control, the, hemo, the level of hemoglobin A1C for, cut, for a cut point was 9%. Uh, today, that cut point in terms of clinical management is 7%. So uh, that um, would not probably have made much of, of a difference. And yet, uh, this was, these were the, the values we were using at the time of this study. It was a, well, a while ago, as you can see, in 1998. And what we see is 41% of people uh, without diabetes demonstrated uh, alveolar bone loss using those uh, panoramic radiographs that you saw in the previous slide. Uh, as a, uh, and in comparison, the 57% of those um, with a hemoglobin A1C, um, the, um, less than 9% and having diabetes. And, the, and of course, there's a dramatic increase in those who had diabetes and were poorer controlled as, as well. So um, this, um, this was one of the studies that, um, with where we were able to see that um, diabetes and, di and glycemic control are important factors in um, loss of support, supporting alveolar bone. Um, now I wanna show you another study. This study was by um, Ryan Demmer and his collaborators at the time they were at uh, Columbia University. And here we have um, over, people who were followed over time and um, in a cohort study, uh, and this is the amount of change in attachment loss um, over time. So here are people who without diabetes, the interesting thing about their study was that it included adults with both uh, type two diabetes as well as type one diabetes. So what, so what happened over time, if we look at people who had poorly controlled um, type two diabetes, we see that their uh, bone loss was, was uh, much greater than those who had um, controlled diabetes. So here's the contrast. This is over the same period of time of follow-up in terms of bone um, attachment loss, not bone loss, it's the attachment loss. And the attachment actually uh, is composed of the periodontal ligaments the, uh, that, atta that um, attach the alveolar bone to the, to the root surfaces. So that when that uh, attachment uh, starts to recede, uh, we call it attachment loss. Then if we look at people who had uh, adults with type one diabetes, and this is one of, uh, there are sub several studies in Scandinavia that um, include adults with type one diabetes. And yet um, here's the study that um, shows the, sorry. Here we have uncontrolled people with type one diabetes, poorly controlled, type one diabetes. Um, and and um, here's what it was for, oops. And, and, and this is in contrast to those who had well-controlled type one diabetes. So it's not just the diabetes that makes a, a difference. It also is the degree of control of the diabetes that has an impact over time on the destruction of periodontal tissues. I'm going to go to the next slide. Now we're going to uh, spend a, uh, just a few moments talking about gestational diabetes. And uh, we're back to uh, cross-sectional studies now. And this is a set of cross-sectional studies that um, I just need to move. Um, I just need to move um, a, I have a, a bar with some menus covering my, my title. Uh, I, I know what it is, so, so I'm not going to use our time uh, moving that. But anyway, this is uh, these are several studies that um, actually investigated the association of gestational diabetes with the prevalence of periodontal disease. 
And as you can see, uh, consistently, there, uh, there's a higher proportion of those who had women who had gestational diabetes having uh, periodontal disease prevalent than those who did not have uh, gestational diabetes. And the odds ratios are um, all um, reasonable odds ratios. Uh, there's one that actually showed a protective effect here in this case. Um, and um, because the odds ratio is a fraction. But the, the, the overall um, view was that the, there was a significant association. And that's all to what we could say is association at, this at that point in time, those points in time, uh, where the odds ratios are here and here are the 95% confidence intervals, or they reported a p-value, which would mean that the 95% confidence interval did not include one. So these, are, these were uh, early studies to, um, to, su to suggest and, and show in their study populations that uh, periodontitis and gestational diabetes were associated. And from that, uh, from those findings, there uh, evolved a series of studies that um, were systematic reviews and meta-analyses to um, identify the study, look at the results of, the, of, of, of several studies, as you can see in this diagram, combine those results and do quantitative analysis on those, on the, um, on the group of studies, as opposed to the slide previously where I showed you individual studies. So this slide is a, a recent a meta, uh, it was a meta-analysis by Kumar and colleagues in 2018. The most important uh, points of this slide are, here are the list of the, of the study. Here, here's a list to the, over to the left of the slide, are the authors, the year of the studies, and also uh, the number of cases and controls and control members of the group. Over here, we, uh, what's important about these these uh, figures as the, the odds ratio. So we're looking to see if the odds ratio, uh, if there was a, a positive odds ratio greater than one and that the 95% confidence interval uh, in, did not include one. There are variety, varieties there. The most important part of this uh, slide is this plot. This is the forest plot. And the forest plot uh, gives you the point estimate, which would be the odds ratio, and then shows you the 95% confidence interval for each of the studies. Uh, this is a mixture of case control as, uh, I'm sorry, of cohort studies as well as, um, as, well as um, longitudinal studies. Now, the, the, the absolute most important thing about this in summarizing it is that this is the quantification here. Um, and where this diamond exists then um, determines whether or not the sum of all, all of the findings is, uh, results in a statistically significant association between gestational diabetes and periodontitis. Where, and this line is the uh, null line, which would say there's no, there's no significance. As you can see, the diamond, it, it does not touch the line. Therefore, there's a, uh, this false plot tells us uh, with high statistical significance, P is um, equal to 0 0.005, that there is an association between um, gestational diabetes and the prevalence of periodontitis or periodontal disease, depending on how the authors, uh, depending on how the authors defined it. So then um, what, um, now I'm going to look at, um, share some information about diabetes, periodontite, uh, prediabetes and tooth loss. Um, here, where this is uh, two kinds of tooth loss. One is one type of tooth loss we uh, call partial tooth loss. The other type of tooth loss we call uh, complete edentialism. So in, uh, in the NHANES data, um, we've conducted an analysis to determine um, whether or not there are any significant differences between people without diabetes, those with prediabetes, or those with diabetes 
and the mean number of missing teeth. And in this case, again, we see that gradient. We would expect to see a gradient by age uh, with the, the number of missing teeth increasing as age increases, as we see here. And then what, what we also see is a gradient whereby diabetes status or non-diabetes status um, has a gradient, has that same kind of gradient. First, over all of the population um, in the, uh, who were participating in this, in this study or who were analyzed in this study, we see significant differences from uh, compared to those who were, uh, did not have diabetes or, or normal glycemic status uh, for everybody summarized. And we see here uh, diabetes, here's prediabetes and diabetes are, sig and are significantly, uh, have significantly greater mean missing teeth. And then in those 65 plus, we see that for diabetes, those with diabetes had a significant greater uh, number of mean missing teeth. So now we're getting at missing, uh, missing teeth. Why would we want to study missing teeth? Because people missing teeth, uh, particularly if they have diabetes, there, there could be difficulty with uh, chewing. There could be difficulty with their diet selection. Um, there are also, of course, um, social and fun other functional um, um, impairments when, with uh, teeth, when teeth and large numbers of teeth start to miss. So it's, it's important, uh, missing teeth, uh, particularly uh, people with diabetes is an important, uh, another important oral health dimension that, um, that um, we pay close attention to. So move, coming back to the part, uh, to the Pima Indian study, we look at those, compare those with no diabetes to those who had type two diabetes. And again, in each age group, we see that there is a difference in terms of, the, and we see a gradient by age again, that's constant. And we see that there are much higher proportions in, in many of the age groups that um, in those, for those having um, partial tooth loss, any partial tooth loss in this case, uh, in, between those who were type had diabetes and those who did not. It levels off in the older age groups in the Pima Indians. Ah. I have a I have a trigger mouse, um, and if my, if my when my hand gets close to it, it um, it reacts. Um, so anyway, um, the as you can see the. The gradient is, is, is attenuated quite a bit. And that's because in, uh, in the uh, Pima Indians, there, were, uh, there was considerable tooth loss in um, both those with and without diabetes in the older age groups. Uh, so here, um, we're looking at, um, we're looking again at, uh, this is um, risk for uh, losing um, one or more teeth. Um, and again, this, this is a health in Pomerania study in Germany. Um, and what we can see uh, again are uh, those individuals with type two diabetes uh, um, controls and type two diabetes, type, one, type two diabetes uncontrolled. We have type one diabetes controlled and type one diabetes uncontrolled. And what we see in, in, each, in each of the comparisons is that those who were poor or controlled uh, with their diabetes, and these are adults again, um, had um, greater um, risk for losing um, for tooth loss. And uh, we see it in the type two diabetes, we see it in the type one diabetes. And um, we also see it in those who had um, incident diabetes, there's a, a difference between those who are diabetes free. And also um, I already spoke about the, the differences in the degree control. So diabetes control is an important, uh, is an important characteristic to, to keep in mind as we, um, as we conduct analysis and um, of the relationships between oral, oral health and diabetes. Um, so then um, looking at um, partial tooth loss, looking at complete edentulism again, we look at the prevalence of edentulism by diabetes status and age in US adults. Again, we see that pattern. Uh, we see a pattern, not as striking in some of the other slides, but overall 
there's a pattern whereby those who have diabetes have a, a greater prevalence of edentulism than those who do not have, um, who either have prediabetes or no diabetes at all. Um, the place where we saw the statistical significance was in the 45 to 64 year old, old group. Um, and yet um, there is this, there still is this gradient uh, small, um, of tooth loss by age. And then um, in this um, group, the 45 to 64 years, 65 plus year olds, we see um, not only the gradient by age, but we see um, a tendency for a gradient if based on uh, diabetes status. Interestingly, those who had normal glycemia are, uh, actually have um, more edentulism, higher proportional edentulism than those who had prediabetes. Um, well, I need to look further to be able to explain that difference. Now, we're gonna change gears. Um, another diverse perspective is um, actually periodontal, in fact, turning things around, we're looking at now periodontal disease, periodontal infection, and its adverse effects on um, glycemia in people who have, uh, do not have diabetes, as well as some diabetes outcomes. So then um, the, um, the inflammatory burden is what, uh, what plays in a, a major role in periodontal, uh, periodontal disease impact on diabetes and glycemic control. So there's a, there's a, we have a hypothesized bio and, and also substantiated by various um, laboratory tests that um, help us to understand why periodontitis or uh, periodontal disease, uh, which would include gingivitis and periodontitis, have a, uh, a pathway. And I'm gonna look, we'll look at that pathway now. So then uh, one of the things is that um, periodontitis, as you, as you can see on the right, uh, the inflamed tissue, the calculus, uh, leading to uh, accumulation of bacterial plaque, and, and that plaque, bacterial plaque then uh, produces products and also the, the, the inflamed tissue, as you see the red and, uh, the red and gingiva here um, is a, a, in the, uh, an image of inflamed tissue and you see the bone loss. This, this, inflammatory, this inflammatory state, this, and it's a chronic inflammatory state, is, has very, several, um, several characteristics that are similar to the chronic inflammation of visceral obesity. So it uh, pro produces a pro-inflammatory state in which there's a cr chronic overexpression of cytokines and they would be inflammatory cytokines. Those of importance um, and common to um, obesity as well as periodontal, periodontitis and the inflammation and an inflammatory response associated with it are interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor, tumor necrosis factor alpha, as we, and um, those, as you can see, those um, mediators can contribute to insulin resistance. That is the inability for the insulin to um, uh, stimulate the cells to be able to absorb glucose from the bloodstream. And um, also, the, in addition to, um, in addition to um, contributing to insulin resistance, those inflammatory mediators, again, disseminated through the circulation, um, through the inflamed periodontal tissues also activate the liver to, um, to produce a set of inflammatory reactants. Um, so they call the acute phase response for the livers. That would include C-reactive protein, uh, fibrinogen, plasminogen, activator inhibitor. And those also contribute to insulin resistance. So you can see there are a couple of pathways at, at, at work. Uh, in different parts of the body as um, periodontal inflammation uh, disseminates uh, its bacterial products as well as the uh, inflammatory mediators. And those, um, and insulin resistance then contributes to impaired fasting glucose, impaired glucose tolerance, which uh, capture not only uh, diabetes diagnosis, but also pre-diabetes diagnosis. Also insulin resistance leads to diabetes and um, also poorer glycemic control. And um, similarly, the acute phase reactants from the liver 
contribute to uh, those same uh, the, those same out, um, unfavorable outcomes that we see in the bottom right. Additionally, uh, the pro-inflammatory uh, state actually uh, creates pancreatic beta cell damage and um, and it uh, reduces the amount of insulin act or eliminates the amount of insulin actually being pr produced. So from that theoretical uh, model, uh, there's an empirical evidence uh, with respect to um, periodontitis and insulin resistance. And I'm gonna share the results of a cross-sectional study first uh, using NHANES data from 99 to 2004. These were US um, adults who did not have diabetes. And um, exposure was periodontal disease uh, and it was the quartiles of mean probing pocket depth as well as using the CDC AAP uh, definition for no mild or moderate severe. So the comparison was uh, with the first quartile of mean pocket depth or the, compare, or the control group was those who had no or mild periodontal disease. Uh, the outcome was the HOMA insulin resistance measure. Uh, HOMA stands for homeostasis model of assessment of insulin resistance. Uh, and uh, the results of that study showed that periodontitis was associated with um, the, HOMA, HOMA, the HOMA insulin resistance measure and the relative, the relative risk that they es estimated here um, was uh, 1.24 times higher um, association than those, who, um, than those who did not have, those who were in the lower quartile or had um, less periodontal disease. The, and, and looking at those with uh, severe association, uh, um, uh, severe uh, periodontitis as defined by the CDC AAP definition, those with uh, those who had demonstrated HOMA uh, insulin resistance, their um, association or the relative risk was a twofold, a twofold greater association than those who were uh, who had um, mild or moderate periodon or no or mild periodontitis. So this is um, a start to um, empirical evidence. We can't make a causal association because it's a cross-sectional study. And yet uh, the, uh, this, these models were adjusted for other covariates and potential confounders. So that again uh, adds strength to the evidence that the, there's, there is an association or uh, to the suggestion that there's association. So then um, I see my time is, I'm gonna, pause for a minute, check in with Gina. My time is um, running tight and I wanna make sure with Gina that everything's okay uh, for, and I will bring, let, I would like you to let me know when I should stop and we'll go, for, go with question and answers. So. Okay, uh, okay, okay. Go, Dr. Taylor, we have, um, if you can maybe another five minutes, we do have okay. questions already. Okay, all right. So uh, another study um, investigated the uh, association of periodontal infection with impaired glucose tolerance. Uh, glucose tolerance test, of course, is one of the ways to um, identify those with diabetes or those with pre-diabetes. This again was another cross-sectional study um, in Haines uh, 2009 to 2010. And um, these were U.S. adults who were these were U.S. adults who were um, diabetes free. The exposure was um, periodontal disease, and the comparison group were those in the in the 75th percentile of probing depth or had um, no or mild periodontal disease. Um, the outcome again was impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting glucose, and the results in conclusion. Uh, found a statistically significant association between periodontal infection and um, impaired glucose tolerance. The odds ratio here was 1.93, um, and uh, with a no with a 95% confidence interval that, that that did not include one. So uh, similarly, using the 75th quartile as the exposed group. Uh, 
the uh, when probing pocket depth was greater than that than the, the that 75th quartile, there was also a significant association, as you can see in the odds ratio. All right. So that this again, the study was adjusted for other important characteristics. So then um, we could we'll move to uh, periodontal disease and dysglycemia uh, development, uh, but not diabetes. So there were uh, have been a, a couple of studies that have actually um, followed people at, in cohort studies for uh, five years or ten years, and you see in this slide. The results of those studies were that um, hemoglobin A1C, uh, the measure of, of um, glycemic control that hemoglobin A1C provides for us, was um, greater um, after five years in those people who had um, uh, experienced periodontal disease. I'm going to uh, talk about one last topic and then we'll uh, be happy to uh, respond to questions. So next, uh, another dimension is whether or not periodontal infection um, has an influence on glycemic control in people with diabetes. There are observational epidemiological studies and there are also a set of uh, clinical trials and, and systematic reviews and, meta and meta-analysis of those clinical trials. Here we can um, quickly see that uh, by race and um, or ethnicity, uh, there were uh, greater uh, there were greater proportions of people, or the prevalence was higher in um, the non-Hispanic, Black, Mexican American, and also all his Hispanics. Uh, just as a just as a, a way of getting a, a sense for the the burden of uh, periodontal disease, periodontitis in uh, under in, in our uh, minority populations. All right, so then um, I'm going to go past this and show you this result here. So um, the question here was whether or not uh, the alveolar bone loss uh, or a marker of severe periodontitis that you saw early on in those radiographs has any um, influence because these people were um, followed for two years on whether or not they have um, whether or not they have poor glycemic control. And in the two younger age groups, you see the 20, 34, and 35 to 44, we actually see uh, significant uh, differences in terms of um, those uh, in the red box who had uh, bone loss and compared to those in the blue uh, red bars that did not have bone loss. And um, it tells us that uh, for sure, after in um, the, the longitudinal studies, two-year follow-up, that people who were at were good control at baseline actually developed poorer control over two years follow-up than those uh, than those who had better control diabetes. And with that, I'm going to stop and, and so that we can entertain some questions. And if they if we finish early, I'd like to talk a little bit more about. Um, gestational diabetes, which is a, another important uh, part of, of the story when we think about relationships between diabetes and oral health. Um, thank you uh, so much for your attention so far. And um, I'll be um, asking Gina, uh, Dr. Thornton Evans to tell me about um, the questions. Uh, yes, Dr. Taylor, thanks so much. Um, one question that came in was the with reference to the scale of the, the break off between uncontrolled and a controlled diabetic. Yes. Uh, actually, in, in terms of the A1C. Yeah. Um, I showed, uh, I showed you know, in the Pima Indian study, it, the cutoff was nine uh, for the hemo, nine percent for the hemoglobin A1C. That's not the case now. Uh, typically, the cutoff point. Um, from, for epidemiologic studies. Uh, well, it, it can vary in epidemiologic studies. Uh, but, um, in terms of clinical management, the, the cutoff now where we uh, get concerned or where um, clinicians get concerned is at, at um, anything seven or greater. Okay, thank you. Another question, Dr. Taylor. Um, are there any studies that show impact of treatment of periodontal infection on glycemic control? Yes, um, 
I can zip through those slides. Uh, how many more questions we have? Because I'd love to sh share that with you all right now. Yeah, we have a few more, but just um, okay. those slides that would let, be let me go to that. Let me go to that slide, those that set of slides. Uh, okay, so now we're talking, now we're into the next another study design. Those are going to be the randomized control style, control studies, where we have a treatment group and we have a control group. As you can see, we follow them to uh, determine the differences in the outcome. So yes, uh, they, uh, there, there are a series of randomized controls trials that I'd like to talk with you about. Um, so we're talking about non-surgical um, periodontal therapy, routine periodontal therapy. So um, here's a, an example of a person. Um, this person could have had diabetes. These are their lower teeth. Look how, how inflamed the tissue is. This is the kind of a result that you can get. See the tissue healing, looks so much healthier. Um, and um, from that, uh, there are a number of systematic reviews and meta-analyses that have actually um, assessed studies. Early on, um, early on um, there were studies that, um, there were um, studies um, conducted or systematic reviews where um, the number of uh, studies was 10. Um, these are the numbers of studies. These are the number of randomized controlled studies in their review. the type of diabetes, um, number of participants, and the change in A1C. This is the most important part. This, uh, and as long as the confidence interval doesn't include one, we know that um, the non-surgical periodontal therapy or the routine scaling and root planing caused uh, a reduction in hemoglobin. That would be like um, going from 7.4 to 7.0 or going from, um, 8.5 to a reduction to uh, 8.1. So this is what those and those these uh, values are the, in the hemoglobin A1C are clinically are clinically meaningful. Uh, they are the uh, equivalent of and in in some ways of adding an extra oral hypoglycemic if a person were taking um, oral hypoglycemia. So these are um, these are uh, important findings, and they uh, suggest to us that there is a there is a benefit um, to that uh, to um, routine scaling and root planing in people with diabetes and controlling their um, glycemia. Now um, with that with that um, this evidence. The, um, in 2000 and th uh, 2013, um, um, there were NID, during that period of time, NIDCR funded a multi-center randomized control trial. Uh, the population were people with type two diabetes, uh, hemoglobin A1C uh, for inclusion was 7% to less than 9%. So those, uh, and, um, and also there were, this was one, the, the largest clinical trial that um, had been conducted. Uh, the intervention, of course, was scaling and root planing, uh, supportive periodontal therapy at uh, three and six months, and the control group received no treatment for six months. The outcome was the difference in hemoglobin A1C change. That was not included in those systematic reviews that we just looked at before seeing this. Uh, so what were the results? What was the outcome of that clinical trial? Enrollment stopped early because of futility. Uh, the treatment group, uh, the hemoglobin A1C uh, increased actually to 0.17%. Um, and in the control group, it increased to 0.11%. So um, NIDCR um, uh, discontinued, uh, ended the study early uh, because there was no, there was no effect. Then uh, there was, and there was no significant difference between the groups. So then um, people interested in, um, um, the uh, uh, colleagues who are interested in, in this topic actually noticed some um, difficulties with, had difficulties with the, the way that the study was designed. First of all, the, the point for entry, the inclusion criterion of 7% to less than 9% was uh, that was reported and this was uh, uh, published seven percent to nine percent. That's just that was too low to be able to be uh, attain an improvement in glycemic control. Another one is that um, the periodontal uh, the periodontal care 
uh, failed to reach a, a, an accepted standard of care in terms of resolution. If you think back at that picture I showed you of the, the very uh, the calculus and the very inflamed periodontal lower very periodontally diseased lower anterior teeth and after treatment how how the resolution occurred. This was that was not the kind of resolution that occurred in the NIDCR study. So also um, there was no consideration of obesity as another uh, as another factor in terms of um, of uh, the chronic inflammatory state. So it was not addressed. So then uh, another set of an, uh, systematic reviews came out. Uh, and these, these systematic reviews included the NIDCR um, randomized controlled trial uh, that I just talked about. The reason that um, it's significant that these included the randomized controlled trial is, as I mentioned, that study, act, that single study actually had the largest number of it was a multi-center study, which is uh, excellent for uh, uh, supporting the results of, a, of an RCT, a randomized controlled trial. And, um, and also it's, um, it's important to include those because the number, the size of the study, the design of the study would have a tremendous weight on the uh, a tremendous impact. And there's ways to calculate the weight of the impact on the results of the systematic reviews and meta-analyses. As you can see, uh, as you can see in the um, change in hemoglobin A1C, whereas before the NIDCR study was included in the meta-analysis, we were seeing 0.4% uh, reduction in hemoglobin A1C. Now we see it's uh, 0.36, around 0.3 or so. And, um, and yet, this is still a clinically, um, a clinically important reduction. Um, and so um, it, while the, you can see the influence of the NIDCR study that was discontinued and where they found no significant effect, they're still um, through the systematic reviews and meta-analysis um, continues to be um, strong evidence. That's in my opinion, uh, strong evidence that uh, Routine non scaling imperial root planing, um, periodontal root scaling and root planing has a, has a, a beneficial effect um, and a clinically meaningful effect on reduction in hemoglobin A1C. So, what, why, do we, why should we be concerned if um, oral health care makes a difference? One is that any substantial lowering of blood glucose in people with diabetes uh, delays uh, or, or delays the progression or onset of complications. Another one is every percentage point reduction in hemoglobin A1C leads to a, uh, you can, uh, a reduction in the risk of microvascular complications of 35%. And um, also a reduction by 0.2%, uh, like we saw in um, the slides, um, leads to a 10% reduction in mortality. And with that, I will stop uh, because I'd like to respond to a few more questions before we run out of time, if possible. Yes, thanks so much, Dr. Taylor. I just uh, want to just extend my appreciation for you participating today in this webinar and for all those that are actually online. And just wanted to let everyone know that we will have our next um, lecture um, in February. Um, 2022, and Dr. Lois Cohen will be our um, speaker, who's an NIH consultant, and also a Paul G. Rogers Ambassador for Global Health Research at NIDCR. So just check out our uh, website for more information about that. But one thing I would like to cover quickly, um, uh, Dr. Taylor, is you are working on a policy statement for the American Public Health Association that focuses on um, the PPOD initiative that was initially done by the National Diabetes Education Program. Could you share very quickly um, the work being done with respect to that? Yeah, I'm, and I'm going to start with the I'm going to start with the end. The policy statement was approved. So what? And the and the essence of the policy statement is to uh, is to advocate for um, our dental organizations, our pharmacy organizations, our, uh, our podiatry organizations, as well as our opt 
optometric organizations to work in collaboration um, in, in, in a way to enhance care of people with diabetes. Um, and so it is to develop the, the partnerships and collaborations that, um, and to work inter, interprofessionally to be able to uh, upgrade, upgrade um, the level of care, the level of attention, and also to learn more about what, what each person is doing. So it's very closely linked to the history of PPOD, that's for sure, very closely linked. Um, so we wrote a, a policy statement and, um, and, that, and submitted it to the American Public Health Association. It was approved last week, actually, uh, during the uh, APHA meeting. So that, is, um, that was a, 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 a work of, of love for everyone who was involved. We have um, um, our oral health component of the uh, um, American Association of Dental Public Health had participants. Um, I, I, including me, I was one of the participants in shaping that policy statement. And we are thrilled to announce that, yes, it was, uh, it was approved. So now the work, the, next, the work begins to build those collaborations and then to actually show results from um, those, those collaborative interprofessional relationships. Okay, thank you, Dr. Taylor. We have, I think, a question from uh, Dr. Timothy. Okay. Um, from SSANM, Dr. Timothy, do you want I, to state I, your question? I apologize. I don't have a question. I'm sorry. I didn't realize that my my computer went on. Hi, Dr. Taylor. Hi. I to Hi. Say Hi, Dr. Timothy. Oh, no questions. Thank you. I'm sorry. Glad to see no you. Problem. No problem. And I think, um, I think you've pretty much covered everything um, just through some of the other slides. So that um, concludes the webinar for today. And I want to just um, thank everyone for participating and for also um, for people to be aware of our next lecture series that will be in February of 2022 um, with Dr. Lois Cohen. So thanks to everyone and to our um, communication and policy team for all their help with uh, this particular lecture series today. Thanks.